So when, a, when you're pushing directly on the pivot, the torque is zero. Does that mean that when you're pushing directly on a pivot, the force is zero? No. That's a very common mistake that I see students make. They hear their instructor always saying, oh, oh, we can treat that as zero because it's at the pivot. And they think that that means, and they start treat, imagining they can ignore the force. Well, we can't ignore the force. We can only ignore the torque from the force. Why is this important? Well, we're probably going to solve a question like this using, I already mentioned this, this equation, this equation, and this equation. Oftentimes, we'll need all three of these equations to solve these types of problems. Well, when I'm calculating the net torque, should I include this force here in the net torque? Is this force going to give us a net torque? Yeah. I'm sorry, is this force going to give us a torque on the object? Well, that multiplied with R. Well, well, what is R for this force? Zero. So is it going to give us a torque? No. No. Okay. Because R is zero. As we were just saying, the torque is zero. So, uh, of course, you could put in the torque from this force, but then they're just going to replace that with a zero. Right. Okay. All right. So this force is not going to contribute a torque to this okay. equation. But is it going to contribute a force to these equations? Yes. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out that's a common student mistake that I see. They, they realize that they don't have to take this into account when they're working with this equation. And then they think that means they don't have to take it into account in these equations either. Well, no, there's still a force here. This can still move the object up and down. Okay. It just can't rotate. Again, remember, no matter how hard I push here, I can't make this rotate, but I could push the chalk up. Mm -hmm. So this is a force that's causing translational movement. It's just not causing rotation. I, I just wanted to go into that to show again, torque and force are analogous, but they're not the same things. At the pivot point, the torque is zero, but there still is a force. Now, here's two forces pushing on the same point. Which of these is going to be more effective at causing rotation? The perpendicular one. That's right, the perpendicular one. Because only the component of the force that's perpendicular to this object is going to cause rotation. Only the component of the force that's perpendicular is going to cause rotation. So then would they be the same if you broke the other one into components? Because they're not perpendicular. So what we want to do is say only this component is causing rotation, but this would have to be less than 8 newtons here, because this is the hypotenuse of the triangle. Oh, uh, okay. Of course, it would be possible to, uh, if I was to push with a bigger force here, so that its, um, its perpendicular component was equal to 8 newtons. Okay. Anyway, the point I wanted to make is, only the component of the force that is perpendicular to the object is causing rotation. How can we prove that? Well, first of all, common sense tells you that if you want to rotate the chalk, what's the best way to push on it? Well, common sense would tell you that the best way to rotate the chalk is to push perpendicularly. Just like if, say, you're trying to open a door. Well, when you're trying to open a door, you push perpendicularly into the door. You don't push at a diagonal, because that would weigh some of your force. We can also look at the extreme case. When I'm pushing perpendicularly to the object, I get a lot of rotation. But what about the other extreme when I push parallel to the object? Well, now I can't cause it to rotate at all. It doesn't matter how hard I push, I can't cause any rotation. So in this case, there would be no torque. This is another example of a case where there's a force that's not causing any rotation, so it's not causing any torque. So what we're seeing here is that if you pushed parallel to the object, it wouldn't cause any rotation at all. That helps us to see that only the component of the force that's perpendicular to the object causes rotation. Here, this has one component that is perpendicular and one component that is parallel. Well, this component of the force that's parallel, we can disregard. It's not going to cause any rotation. At least we can disregard this in terms of torques. But this is going to cause a rotation. Well, the way we would write that is what I wrote down before wasn't quite right. I said that the torque depends on the force, but it doesn't. It only depends on the component of the force that is perpendicular to R. And that's what this little symbol here means. I think this is a symbol I saw in your lecture notes that your instructor uses. Mm -hmm. So, now this is a little bit of a cryptic symbol. What does this mean? This is the component of the force that is perpendicular to the R vector. 
So that's important to have in your notes. This is the component of the force that is perpendicular to the R vector. And what is the R vector? The R vector is a vector that goes from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. That's something else that can be confusing. R is a vector that goes from the, point, uh, from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. So in this case, this would be the R vector. And one thing we have to get in the habit of doing is actually drawing the f and the r vectors from the pivot point to the point of application of the force. Maybe I'll put it up here. So we don't have to do the vector sign in these cases? The vector sign. Like over r? Like if you're like that, that way. Yeah, um, you, you could do that. However, um, the vector interpretation of torque is a little bit more complicated. And you, um, your, your instructor did go over it, but you won't need it for most problems that you're solving. When you're solving problems, you don't usually put the arrow on top of things. Okay. So um, what we're trying to do here, again, in, in preparation for solving numerical problems. And for that, it's probably best to leave out those little arrow symbols. Uh, technically speaking, If we're going to write this as vectors, this is the full vector equation okay. over here. That is something your instructor went over, but for most problems, we won't need to get into the, the subtleties here. So we'll get back to that if we have time. Just finding torques is actually um, pretty difficult, so let's make sure we know how to find this torque here. Uh, so I got a hand out on that too, because that uh, is it's pretty difficult. All right, so here's the, another rotation handout. How to find the torque exerted by individual force. The first thing you notice is it takes up the whole page. So it really is kind of complicated how to find torque. It's no surprise that students have difficulty with it. There's actually two different methods. The one on the left is the one you usually use. So that's the one we can go through here. All right, so starting at the top, how to find the torque exerted by an individual force. Remember that the torque tells you how effective the force will be in changing the object's rotation. So we're going to use the F perpendicular method, because that's the equation that we have, F perpendicular. So step one, you draw the force at its point of application. Well, in this problem, I've already done that. I've drawn in the force, and very important, I've shown where it's being applied. Okay. This is something new that didn't happen with translational movement. With translational movement, it wasn't usually that necessary to show where the force was being applied. You just said what object it was being applied to. But with rotation, it's not, just, it's not good enough to say the force is being applied somewhere on this object. You have to say exactly where it's being applied, because we know that different locations can give you different torques. All right, uh, then we'll go through the F perpendicular method. Draw the axis of rotation or the pivot point. Well, in this case, we've labeled this as our pivot point. Going down the left-hand column, step three. Draw R from the axis of rotation to the point of application. That's what I've already done here. Now, this is the step that students tend to get lazy and skip. They don't realize that R is a whole vector. So it's a really good idea to actually draw the R vector from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. And now I have to tell you how long this is. So let's say this is 3 meters. I just made that number up. That's the kind of number you would be given in the problem. Step four, draw and determine F perpendicular. Remember that F perpendicular is the component of the force that is perpendicular to R. Well, here's where you can use some of the skills from that series of videos that you watched on breaking things into components. So let's break this into components and figure out what its perpendicular component is. That 
was fast. Good. It's a good idea to label the components. This is f perpendicular. This is what we could call f parallel, because this is the component of the force that's parallel to r, but we don't care about this component. And you saw that f perpendicular is opposite to the 20 degrees, so from Sokotoa, you use the sine. So 